Hi, I'm Shumon. And hi, I'm Benita. And I'm Tessa. <laughs> so we have Tessa with us. She's a neuroscientist and HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow at Columbia University. She holds a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard University and a BA and MPhil in genetics from the University of Cambridge. Mm-hmm. As a PhD student, she dissected molecular pathways underlying zebrafish embryogenesis in Alex Skyer's lab and co-created the CRISPR-Cas web tool ChopChop. In the final year of her PhD, after attending the 2017 embryology course at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, she became fascinated by cephalopods, cuttlefish, octopuses, and squid. This inspired her to return to Woods Hole as a grass fellow in 2018 and to launch a novel research program on cuttlefish camouflage in her postdoc. As a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Nobel laureate Richard Alex, she is trying to understand the neural basis of cuttlefish camouflage behavior. Specifically, she wants to uncover how the physical properties of the visual world are represented by patterns of neural activity in cuttlefish's brain and how this representation is transformed into an approximation of the physical world on the skin. Emily, we welcome you here today and we would request you to like talk about your work on like if you want to present anything. I grew up in London, England and when I was a kid I was interested in lots of different careers but the one that really stuck for me was to be a CIA agent so I was obsessed with being a spy and I thought the secret to that was getting a black belt in kickboxing but before I became a CIA agent I really wanted to go to the University of Cambridge And um, I went to a sort of regular public school. um, And one day I was walking through the school corridors and I saw a little advert for a summer internship program at what was called the National Institute for Medical Research. And so on a whim, I just applied for it because really I thought it will help me get into Cambridge. (laughs) Not that I was that interested in it, I have to admit. But this became my first research experience. So when I was 17, and I worked on chick embryo development. So I still remember the first time I opened a fertilized egg and I made this little window in the top of the egg and, and peered down. And there was this tiny little chick embryo, which looks like this. You, you can't really see the outline of it. And these are obviously all the blood vessels coming out, sitting on top of the yolk. And I zoomed in on the microscope and saw this tiny, tiny little heart pumping away. And I just thought it was the most magical thing that something microscopic could have a beating heart and that it could be my job to kind of figure out how this tiny microscopic ball of cells becomes a sort of complex multicellular organism. And so I worked for three months in Malcolm Logan's lab and I fell in love with um, science research and I presented my work at a science fair in London And I guess my enthusiasm was infectious or something because I ended up being selected to represent the UK in the 2007 International Science and Engineering Fair. And so I went to um, Albuquerque in New Mexico and I presented among hundreds of students from all around the world, including I made friends with two um, students from India and I later went and traveled around India. That was really fun, yeah. Um, And so this is, awkward teenage me standing in front of my presentation. I got to ride in a hot air balloon for the first time and I met my first uh, Nobel laureate, which was very exciting. Um, And this, I guess, helped me get a position at um, the University of Cambridge where I studied for three years and then I did four years as a master's student. Um, And I did a degree in genetics. And by that point, even though I didn't really enjoy biology in school, I realized that I absolutely love biology research. And so that kind of powered me through uh, this time. And then, as you mentioned, I got my PhD from Harvard University, um, took about six or six and a half years. Um, And over the course of from high school to undergrad to my PhD and the rotations I did, I worked on chicks, which I already showed you, and then fruit flies, mice, yeast, zebrafish, and so a whole different host of different model organisms. But I kind of stuck to questions in developmental biology of how one single cell can become a complex organism. Like how are we formed from one cell? How does that one cell contain all of the information needed to make 
an adult organism. And I still think that's fascinating. Um, and this is a picture of the fruit fly gut. So when I was an undergraduate, I would dissect out the tiny guts of a fruit fly and stain them. Um, and one of the things I did during grad school, as well as my main project, which I'm not really going to talk about, is I learned how to code. So it's a great time to learn new skills. And I co-created this CRISPR web tool called ChopChop, which is still around today. And I'm actually currently adding new organisms. So we have almost over 400 different organisms from across the evolutionary tree, from viruses to pigs to humans. And people can write into us and request that we add their model organism, and then I add it uh, to the site. And what was so cool about this is I was just learning to write code, and I did get a lot of help from a bioinformatician in um, the lab. But then we put this website online and we published it. And in a two week period, we saw that it was being used all around the world, and, and people were running the web tool every minute or so. And I just thought this was so cool that this kind of graphical representation of how global science is and also how accessible a tool like CRISPR is. Um, one of the other things that I got really involved in during my PhD was outreach um, of various kinds. I did lots of teaching in middle schools, high school students. And one of the highlights for me was mentoring Alia Al-Mansouri, who is at the time was a 14 year old from the United Arab Emirates who applied for this competition called Genes in Space. And I was her mentor and she ended up winning the competition. And so we actually sent her experiment to space and it was performed um, on board the International Space Station. So this is Alia clutching this machine called a mini PCR. So it's like a very affordable PCR machine that's also mini. And a lot of schools use and also people in the field and labs. Um, and this is us in front of the launch pad where the SpaceX rocket took her experiment to space. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then I graduated from Harvard with my PhD. And I, this is the only photo I have of my current boss. This is Richard Axel, who's a Nobel laureate. And um, I sort of fell in love with cuttlefish, as you mentioned, introduction during a course at the Marine Biological Laboratory. And so I sort of convinced Richard to let me start a whole new research program in his lab on cuttlefish camouflage. Um, and I guess the project has been met with a lot of enthusiasm, so I won this um, very exciting fellowship that will fund me during my postdoc and also when I become a faculty member from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, so I thought I would give a brief introduction or tell you a little bit about the actual research I do. And the BBC does a very good job of introducing cuttlefish camouflage, so I'll let them do it. Taking camouflage to the it's hard to believe it looking at these pictures, but all these cuttlefish are exactly the same species. They're simply changing their appearance depending on what's around them. It's called adaptive camouflage, and it's perfect for hiding from the predators. Yeah, that was very like jerky but <laughs> anyway they can change their color and texture in milliseconds and very suddenly and it's very exciting so the question is why do we study cuttlefish so the the fundamental question i'm actually interested in is how does our brain process and perceive the world so if you take a human for example and a human looks at a traffic cone the information from the eye goes through the brain and some kind of, we'd say an internal representation is formed in the brain. But then the thing about humans is we can speak and communicate. So a human can tell you, I see a traffic cone, but we can't really do experiments on humans or not. Um, we can't record neural activity in the brain. So we can't really necessarily understand how a human perceives this. If we take a mouse where we can do recordings in the brain, we could show the animal some kind of visual stimulus and the animal may see a traffic cone it may think a traffic cone, but of course a mouse can't tell us what it sees. And for me, the beauty of a cuttlefish is that because it camouflages to its environment, it basically shows you on its skin what it sees. So this animal would also, of course, it doesn't really see traffic cones, but it would create 
as I said, a sort of internal representation inside the brain, but then this animal shows you, it gives you a display of what it's thinking on its skin. So I think this is a really powerful system to start to uncover how the brain processes and perceives the world. The ultimate experiment that I'm trying to do during my postdoc, and then hopefully these are the kinds of experiments I'll be able to do for the rest of my career, uh, we are trying to um, create a virtual reality for a cuttlefish where we can show it a visual stimulus that causes the animal to camouflage. And so we can image the animal skin pattern, which is the sort of output to the system. They're showing us what they're thinking, but then we could also record neural activity in the brain. And so we can both see what they're thinking and see what the output of the brain is at the same time. And so we're trying to genetically modify cuttlefish to make a transgenic cuttlefish that produces flashes of light in its brain when it's thinking and then simultaneously develop methods to get an, get a cuttlefish to respond to a virtual reality so we can carefully control what it's seeing. And I'll just show you one of the things, because I'm, I'm trying to kind of create this cuttlefish as a new model organism, we're doing a lot of tool building and trying to create some resources so that anyone else could study this species if they wanted to. So one of the things we've done is um, created a embryonic development staging series. So this is the one cell cuttlefish embryo it has this one tiny little cell sitting on top of a big ball of yolk. And then, as I was saying before, this one tiny cell goes through a bunch of cell divisions and then over the course of a month forms a miniature cuttlefish that can already change color. And this is helping us to develop these transgenic or genetically modify these animals. Um, another thing we've done is built a web tool called Cuttlebase, which is a sort of scientific toolkit for this species of cuttlefish we study, which is called um, the dwarf cuttlefish. And so we built a brain atlas. So we imaged using MRI, the brain of a cuttlefish. And then we worked with developers um, and artists and other scientists to build a 3D model of the animal's brain. And we also built a 3D model of the animal's body um, we sliced the brain and we've labeled all of the brain areas. And we've also put some other tools on that website as well. And then, as I said, we're trying to make this virtual reality. So we've built this tank that has digital displays on every side. And we can actually get the cuttlefish to respond to the environment and camouflage. And of course, they don't always like disappear into the background. But the fact that we've got this animal with a totally different visual system to respond to a digital pattern is really exciting. So hopefully in a few years, we'll have a tiny microscope on the animal's head and we'll be actually imaging activity in the brain while the animal is responding to its visual environment. And then finally, we I really care a lot about outreach and making things accessible. And so um, we have this live stream called Cuttlecam. And this is just an example, I think 24 hours in the life of these cuttlefish. Um, for some reason this is covering up. There we go. You can see the, the link there. So um, anyone can look at the cuttle cam any time of day or night. And you'll see the animals swimming around and mating and fighting. And there's a kind of crazy brittle star that reaches its arms around and like tickles the other animals and the the corals come to life and flop at night and there's a lot of activity. So anyone can check it out and see what the animals are doing at any time of day. And that is all. So when did you start falling in love with science? I guess for me, it was the first ever research experience I had. So I, I enjoyed science in high school, but I particularly like maths and chemistry. And I honestly thought biology was really boring because <laughs> it was just memorizing facts. And then I did this internship which I said was really just because I wanted to get into a good university and I just it blew my mind I thought like the reality of biology like actually studying biology seeing things happen in front of your eyes was just the coolest thing in the world and yeah that started a lifelong passion I guess so the journey in science is not only about uh, discovering things in lab it's a lot about discovering your personal self so what would be the one best and the one worst thing you discovered about yourself and your journey? I think the the worst thing, I mean, in terms of just like a skill, the thing that I think was my biggest limitation at some point was my memory. I thought I had a good memory in high school and then I got to Cambridge and the exams 
a lot of it was based on memory. And I, the first year of exams, I absolutely flopped. And I had this whole existential crisis about like, I didn't have what it took to become a scientist. And even now I, I'm really bad at remembering like the papers I've read and it freaks me out sometimes, but I just try and accept that everyone has strengths and weaknesses. One of my main strengths I think is I've developed very effective uh, multitasking and I always plan things ahead. I mean, not just like an experiment ahead, like I plan my career like 10 years in advance. Um, and I think that I think multitasking, I can have many things going all at once. And I'm just in this hyper focus mode where I'm getting this, and this is going. And then while that's incubating, I get this done. And sometimes I think I might be doing like the work of two people at once. Maybe not, but <laughs> that's what I try and do when I have a lot, when I have a lot to get done. I get into the, the zone. As a graduate student or even being in science and we are always having this imposter syndrome. Have you ever faced that and how do you deal with it? I definitely have faced it. I think one of the one of the ways that I faced it is just as in my memory. I have a real a deep insecurity about my memory and the ways it can limit me. And I think it's given me a more holistic view of people's strengths. And I see I don't see intelligence as one peak that you just have, you you score somewhere on a peak. I see it as this kind of big graph with loads of different skills and everyone has strengths and weaknesses and often where your strength is, you might have a weakness somewhere else and vice versa. So I think if I feel insecure about my abilities, I remember that there are so many different skills to have and no one's going to score perfectly on everything. I mean, score, of course, we don't score at all. But, um, but the other thing about, imposter syndrome I think one of the ways maybe it affected me is I told you I'm a big planner I like to think ahead and kind of figure out where I want to be and when I imagined being a postdoc and then eventually hopefully being faculty I was terrified of the idea of being in a crowded field where lots of people trying to do the same thing and I'd be effectively competing and I just felt like why would I succeed in that environment I wouldn't be the first or the best and I might just kind of crumble and so because of this kind of insecurity, I said, well, what if I just do something totally different, like cuttlefish camouflage? What if I just start my whole own program? And so I think like what really came from insecurity led me to be far more creative and kind of bold and courageous than I would have been otherwise. And so far it's massively paid off. And so I think, I think there are ways to turn weaknesses into strengths and ways to see the the silver lining or the glass half full. We, we all are uh, running huddle races, uh, no matter how, how much uh, we practice, there are always like new problems and new instances coming up. So what are the biggest hurdles that you came across in your journey so far? And how did you get over it? I think one of the hardest things about grad school is that project, there are going to be a lot of days and maybe weeks and even months where everything's failing and where like you just don't feel motivated. And so I think one skill I learned is how, how to get through those hard times and like what to do to just create enough discipline that you just kind of keep going. And then at some point it will pass and then you'll get some exciting result that will power you through. So I don't know if this isn't really like a skill or something, but I, I know when times were tough in my PhD and nothing was working, I'd celebrate hump day. So we call Wednesday hump day because it's the hump in the middle of the week. I guess if you're on a Monday to Friday schedule. <laughs> and I used to like every Friday I used to go salsa dancing. And so if if nothing, oh, wow. as I said, if nothing was going well in my lab, I would just be like on Friday, I'm going to dance. It's going to be great. I mean, one thing I've recently started doing is, is sort of managing a bunch of people. And this is something that I realized you get no training in whatsoever. Um, in the scientific journey. So I started just reading loads of books and watching YouTube videos. Um, actually got, I was fortunate to be able to get a career coach who helped me. Wow. And <laughs> this is something where I think, yeah, knowing where you have shortcomings or where you don't know something, there are so many resources out there to figure out how to work on that skill. So in this case, it wasn't any kind of scientific skill. It was like, how do you set expectations? How do you create boundaries? Like all of these kinds of things that will be really important in a career if you ever manage people. And that was a really 
good learning experience for me. Uh, how do you plan your work? Should you? Yeah, I guess I often do a physical map mm -hmm. of like the project. Like I have a, a glass window by me and on the glass I've written cuttlefish camouflage in the middle. And then I have all these offshoots of like the brain atlas, behavior, all the different parts, like the biggest overarching parts of the project. So whenever I'm thinking, like, am I forgetting something? Am I making progress on enough parts of the project? I just look at the map and I'm like, yeah, that's moving, that's moving. So I have this like global view and then I don't plan the whole week in advance. For me personally, I think everything takes longer, even though I try to be efficient, everything takes longer than I think it will. So I think to, to try and determine what I'll do for the entire week just wouldn't be practical. But every morning I come in, I now come in, I used to come in like whatever time I wake up. Now I'm like 9 a.m. every day and it really helps me to kind of like get the day going and be effective. And I just have a post-it note and I write down everything I want to do that day. And then if I, if there's something I know I need to do later in the week, I write it in my calendar. So I kind of schedule it. But yeah, for me, it's, it's some mix between enough flexibility because everything takes longer than you think a really big global view of what's happening. But then like, if I have everything written on a post-it note, then it motivates me because I want to cross everything off. I, so, think, I, I really love the global view approach of things because it, it, it can really ha help because every day you wake up and you see that, that kind of reinforces your thoughts and you can plan things. Yeah, yeah and you kind of know why you're doing it because sometimes yeah. you can get lost in the minutia, right? I'm running this gel and the gel's not working. And it's like, you have to remind yourself why you're doing it and how cool it'll be when you get it to work. True. So, so there's a bottleneck in academia and postdoc positions that can have a vicious cycle. What are the challenges a potential researcher getting into a PhD should consider? I think the main thing, my... The main thing I, I'd, I'd say is I really don't think a PhD is for everyone. And it's not in any kind of judgmental way. I don't think getting a PhD means that you're somehow better than someone who doesn't get a PhD. I think just having been through it, I just think it's for, it is for some people and it's not for others. And I really encourage people who are considering a PhD to like really sit down and think about why you want a PhD and whether it's necessary for, for your long-term goals and ask yourself whether like the nature of doing a PhD is like whether that fits with you as a person. So what I mean is that if you, if you wanna work in industry or like if you really think I'd like a nine to five job that's well paid or I want to work at some government institute or I don't know, all kinds of other careers. I wanna work in science communication or something else. I wanna be a teacher. Maybe a PhD isn't necessary. So I think you should ask yourself, or if, if you just want to do it, because I want to be, I want to be Dr. Montague, it's like, it's cool, but is it worth six and a half years of pain? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just really appreciate that doing research is weird. And I keep coming back to this, like it's so unstructured and it does depend on the lab you're in, but often you're left. And I had amazing mentors. This is no judgment to them, but you, you're sort of left for months without really clear goals. And without really, you don't necessarily know if you're doing the right thing or you maybe you know what your goal is and it just fails over and over and over again. And you just fe face failure every day. You have to ask yourself whether you'll still get out of bed and go, but today might be the day that I'm going to solve it or whether you're just going to feel unfulfilled. So I think it's like about true passion and curiosity. Like, do you really every day you want to find out something about how the world works? Um, and can you deal with this? this kind of lack of structure, like really deep down, are you really self-motivated? And if you are, and if you're really curious, you should do it, but it's not for everyone. And that's totally yes, true. That, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Being one of the primary creators of Cuttlebase, can you tell us the story behind creating Cuttlebase and how everything came about? I, as, as we mentioned, I made this web tool chop chop during my PhD. And I thought it was so cool that you could just anyone can make a website and if it's useful to people before you know it people around the world might be using it so i really saw the value of web tools and also designing something that's actually really usable um so i wanted to let i wanted to create this data set this brain atlas and then make a, a website so that anyone can explore it 
and make it accessible enough that like kids could use it or people outside the field. So that was the kind of goal. And we were working on it during the pandemic. So we also had a lot of time at home to be doing things on computers, I guess. But um, I also, one of the coolest things in my postdoc is I started working with people from other fields, like very different fields. So we now have a cuttlefish facility manager, um, Connor Gibbons, who came from the New York Aquarium. And so he's like an aquarist by trade. He came and joined our team. And then I have an artist called Daniela Garcia Rosales, just fascinated by science. And so she came and joined the team and has created this really creative influence on us. So we kind of assembled this team of artists and aquarists and then a web designer and um, graphic designer. And together with this team of, of people from very different backgrounds, we made the tool. And, it was originally going to be a simple website and then it kind of got fancy and fancier over time. So you have been involved in several SciComm activities and some of them involving children with ASD and uh, children with a deafness. How was your experience in science communication? And to be a bit critical, what do you think we can improve? There are lots of areas of science communication and, and the area that I've decided to kind of focus on is expanding accessibility to science. And I guess I have done so particularly sort of based in the US, though I think like what you guys are doing in India is amazing. So I've kind of focused, especially on middle, middle school, I kind of created a whole zebrafish workshop when I was a grad student, where we would get kids from backgrounds that have been historically excluded in science. Um, and we dress everyone up in lab coats and goggles and we talk about what does a scientist look like and try and break stereotypes. And then they tour the zebrafish facility and they'd like look at transgenic fluorescent zebrafish and they draw them under a microscope. And it was just, it was really, really cool. And all the kids would come out going, I want to be a scientist. But that that was an area I was particularly, and I still am particularly passionate about. Now I'm, I've done more kind of like focused mentoring on specific individuals. Um, but this is something that I think, I think it's important to focus both early in life, but then also in high school, in undergrad, post back, then grad school, post like every single stage of the scientific pipeline is when we say it's a leaky pipeline, people fall out and we have to figure out why. So if you were given the power to change something, what would be that one thing that you would want to change about academia the most? I think right now, the people who rise to the top of academia, who become PIs and sometimes extremely successful PIs, are selected because of their scientific brilliance and not necessarily because of their kindness or how well they mentor people. And so I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of toxic environments, like lots of labs and not very happy yeah. places to work. Um, and so, I mean, in terms of dealing with that reality, my advice is like really choose your lab very carefully talk to people in the lab, talk to people, especially people who recently left the lab, because they'll often be more honest. Mm -hmm. And I just, I really encourage anyone who's choosing a PhD or a postdoc lab to like really make sure that the mentor is a good mentor. But of course it shouldn't be like that. Everyone should be a good manager. And as I was saying earlier, we don't get any training in this. So, so like since you have got, uh, like you did your PhD and then postdoc, so you have experienced both sides of the table, like being a mentor and being a mentee. So how was your experience as both of these? I was really lucky. Well, I was lucky, but also I've been very careful about who I select to be a mentor. But I think one, one sort of lesson for me is people sometimes talk now about mentoring up, meaning even if you're the mentee and you have a boss who in theory sort of, they tell you all their expectations, really like, you have a lot of power and control as the mentee. And so if you don't know what the expectations are of you, just ask to meet with your boss and say, hey, I was wondering if we could discuss ex expectations. My understanding is this is what's expected of me, but maybe you feel differently. So like, let's talk about it. And so there are a lot of ways that as the mentee, you can kind of take charge of the situation, even if you convince your boss that they're really the one in control. And so I like, I like that approach. I think you you do you're in you have some power and some control whether you're the mentor or the mentee. This is something I actually learned from my career coach. I, I was like talking to her and saying like, I just don't understand why this person is doing this. Like, how does she not know that I want this? And she was like, 
have you told her that you want that? And I was like, no. Right. She was like, well, maybe you should tell her. And, and so I just said like, hey, let's talk about expectations in a very friendly way. And it's all it took, it took one conversation. And why would she think that I wanted things one way and rather than a different way? And so I think, and now I've been giving this advice to other people who are saying like, I don't know, I just feel like he wants this, but I can't tell if he wants that. And I'm like, why don't you ask him? <laughs> and it, it seems obvious, but at the moment, it's not obvious, but I think there's a lot you can do with just a very honest conversation. So yeah, are there so any mistakes that you have made and would advise young students to be careful of? You know, life is this complex, rich, beautiful tapestry, and it's not always beautiful and perfect. Sometimes things don't go necessarily according to plan, but it doesn't mean that, it, like sometimes if you have bad experiences, it can be a, a strength because then you know how you got through them. Or when you have a friend going through a bad experience, you can actually talk from a place of honesty and experience and you can give them advice. So it's always easier to look back with retrospect once you've come out of it and you know you're okay. I made loads of mistakes in science, of course. And we've already talked about how I just try and see that as a learning experience, but also in life, I think um, it's part of life's rich tapestry. That's very beautifully put. What do you think about Kitchen Lab? I think it's really cool. I really um, respect, I'm really impressed with what you guys are doing. I think science should be for everyone and there are some barriers to it, like yeah. how expensive some reagents are and that really bothers me. But I think like if you can find a microscope, you can just put things under a microscope. There are so many cool things you can see about the world. And I think curiosity is one of the most beautiful things in people. So I, I think that's amazing that, that you're bringing science um, to, to anyone and everyone. Um, and I also think it's cool that you're doing this interview series because like my personal journey is fairly direct, I guess, because I just went from undergrad to grad school to postdoc, but that's just one of many different journeys and lots of people go like someone in my lab, you know, I'm in the lab of a Nobel laureate. There's somebody who was a musician for maybe even decades before she came and did her PhD in her fifties. And then there's someone else who went to business and she had this whole other career. And then she decided actually, I want to be a scientist. And um, there are so many different ways into science and it doesn't matter what age you are um, or what background you're from. Curiosity is key. Sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you.